How's it going, everyone? My name is Michael SK, and welcome to Chaos Child. We're just gonna jump right in because I don't really have much to say. I've never touched the uh, the Chaos Head or Chaos Child stuff before, except for the Chaos Head anime adaptation, which, in my opinion, is the worst anime I have ever seen. It is god awful, but I have heard that the visual novel is miles better than the anime so i'm just gonna take people's word for it and i'm just gonna jump into this knowledge or or no knowledge of what i should or should not know or whatever of this uh side of the of the science adventure world or universe or whatever the fuck but like i said yeah let's just jump in i don't really have much to say November 6th, 2009 AD, 1028 PM. It came without warning. Now keep in mind, I did jump into this momentarily just to see how the sounds were, but there's no actual character dialogue um, for a while, I guess. So I'm just gonna jump in and cross my fingers, hoping that this is not a loud mess. I have a feeling that this is going to be a loud mess. Solely because of what I just saw on my uh, desktop audio for OBS. We'll have to see. It was a magnitude 7.8 earthquake, with an epicenter directly under the city. The disaster reduced one of Tokyo's busiest downtown areas to nothing in a single night. The high-rise buildings that had birthed so many trends and fads collapsed. As if giving up on their role in society, black fires spread throughout the city as individuals fell into the grip of the crowd's psychology. Their terror was magnified. Combined, all of these things took many lives. The final death toll was 3,851, the final number of injured, 30,927. This event would later be known as the Shibuya Earthquake. Even in all that uh, destruction, people still suffered the most in their hearts. Some who had lost their families came together to share new resolve, while others who had been forced to watch their friends die were driven by guilt to take their own lives. As a baby was miraculously reunited with its parents after 72 hours, a child in an evacuation shelter had asked her dad, when's mommy coming home? He had no answer. Some of the wounded made it to the hospitals by looking at real-time updates on the web. Others saw people on the internet talking about the disaster as if it were a movie and were driven mad. A homeless man was saved from malnutrition by an organized volunteer group, but at the same time, a middle school boy punched a self-centered volunteer who'd come to Shibuya to find himself in the face. It was the first time in that boy's life that he'd ever been violent. And the psychological toll was incredible, and many of the survivors would later manifest symptoms similar to those associated with PTSD. The young were hit the hardest, and before long, the cause of those symptoms was given a name, Chaos Child Syndrome. Rebuilding happened at a feverish pitch never seen before. It felt inappropriate to say hang in there, but people felt that somebody had to do something. The new slogan was Shibuya a city reborn, and no amount of money or manpower was spared in aiding the endeavor. I think Siri got activated somehow by me saying that. The whole town was in the grip of a fever. In private, a leader of the redevelopment efforts said, this may sound unkind, but this frenzy feels like a town burying its grief by holding a festival. Building codes were rigorously evaluated with an eye toward earthquake engineering. Perhaps in an effort to emphasize the city's safety, 
Security cameras were put up all over, t uh, all over town. Excuse me. Shibuya would become a place where everyone could live in peace. That is some building structure right there. Absolutely beautiful. But at the same time, a rumor began to spread about the earthquake. Something about this earthquake doesn't make sense. There were no aftershocks, and the damage had spread in a strange way. Harujuku and Ibusu, areas only a kilometer away from Shibuya, suffered few casualties and even fewer collapsed buildings. This damage pattern had never been observed in any prior earthquake, and so, and so more than a few pundits or pundits claim that the Shibuya earthquake must have been artificial. More than anything, some of the survivors all said the same things. I saw a white light. I heard a sound like a ringing in my ears. Yeah, that's a white light. Too many people experienced this for anyone to laugh it off, but no cause of those phenomena was ever found. It was just more evidence to those who believed that something about the earthquake had been wrong. Then, six years after the strange earthquake in 2015, Something else was about to attract attention in the reborn city of Shibuya. Ooh, a movie. That I can already tell is going to be wickedly loud. Oh, there's a fetus in the, uh... In the D. I don't, I don't, I don't know if you guys saw that. Because I, I didn't. September 7th, 2015, Sunday night. Hey. Okay, so from what I'm looking at in the desktop audio for OBS, the sounds are just a little too loud. So I may I might make some adjustments whenever I'm editing. I'm not sure. The second he spoke, the comment box started to fill. Oh god. <laughs> Uatani Yuoma watched it for a few seconds and then saw the request, when does Haru tell us that she's dating somebody? He smiled to himself. Just what he wanted. Most of the requests were about hot actors for cute idols. His audience was so stupid that it was easy to tell exactly what they were going to ask. The problem was always whether the name that came up was someone he knew. That was a question of luck, and how popular they were. But Haru, her full name was Haruko something or other, she was fine. Just a few days ago, he'd forced himself to go to an event he'd rather have skipped, and seen it for himself. Yes. Satisfied, Uutani got up to get some snacks, like he always did. He lived in a one-bedroom condo located eight minutes from Shibuya Station. Cost? 150,000 yen per- Wait, what? It had been built after the earthquake, so the furnishings and layout were modern. A little more room would have been nice, but compared to the 40,000 yen per month place he'd lived in last year, it was heaven. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna make the uh, the sound adjustments right here, uh, right now, myself. So I think volume for voices need to come down. Background music really does need to come down. Sound effects, I'll bring that down too. And movie volume. Let's give that a shot. At 21 years old, Utani... Ut Uatani, excuse me, I cannot pronounce his name right, whether I try to or not. Uh, he felt satisfied for the first time in his life. In fourth grade, he'd gotten big into online gaming and stopped going to school. Eventually, he'd stopped leaving his room altogether. Ah, some welcome to the NHK shit right there. Then he'd gotten addicted to drugs that made him sleepy, but did nothing else. Okay, that's, that's maybe not the same. Once, seeing only darkness in his future, he'd planned to commit suicide. 
In the chaos after the earthquake six years ago, he'd finally managed to leave his room, but his family had already given up on him. After he failed his entrance exams, he went to live on his own in Shibuya, and he hadn't spoke to his parents since. As far as they knew, he'd failed the exams three times in a row. In fact, he hadn't even gone to the tests after the first time. There wasn't anything he wanted to learn in college, or any companies he wanted to work for badly enough. He had no goal in life at all. But things were different now. He took a block of cheap cheese he'd bought at the supermarket out of the fridge. Usually, he never ate anything this cheap. But on, excuse me, Nikonia live streaming, it wasn't just what you said. How you looked when you said it also mattered. Uatani wasn't a good-looking man, let alone a cute girl. He was just a plain old guy, and so to keep his program popular. He needed to make them think that he was poor, barely managing to scrape by, in fact. That's why he kept the area around his PC and the parts of his apartment that you could see with his webcam completely plain. Last month, he'd finally reached his goal of 4,000 viewers. For a man with nothing going for him like U Uatani, this was extremely unusual. Three months ago, he guessed the winners of a popularity contest a certain idol group was holding, as well as their total number of votes. That must have really paid off. After that, his numbers had been going up steadily. Late last month, when his streams had appeared at the top of Nikonia's page, he'd seen a huge increase. Right now, he'd gotten above 4,500, and it was quite possible he'd break 5,000 by the end of the month. It was around late last year when he'd started to wonder about his power. It was a certain rumor on one of At Chan's occult boards that made him really start to realize what he had. The name he'd chosen for his stream subtly reflected this. Uh, today I learned I can see the future. He took out a knife to cut the cheese. There was a strange sound. Huh? He thought he just imagined it when... I was gonna say, like, man, he's, uh, he's really cutting the cheese in such a, such a rhythm. Knock, 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 knock. He heard it again. It was coming from the door. Someone was clearly knocking on his door. Huh? Suspicious, he walked toward the door to answer, and then checked the clock. It was 11.41 p.m. Yeah, you probably shouldn't open that. That seems kind of sus. Not exactly normal delivery hours. He tried to ignore it. But... They're keeping up that same rhythm. The knocking continued. It was the same rhythm at the same pace. As if the visitor's goal wasn't to come inside, but simply to make that sound. <sighs> Uatani felt a bit creeped out. He decided to go to the intercom camera and see who it was, but then realized that would be pointless. Only the auto-locking door on the first floor had a camera. The door to Uatani's room on the fifth floor had an intercom, but no camera. Uatani gave up. If I'm pronouncing his name wrong, I am sorry, but when it comes to like those double, uh, the double letters, like the O's, the U's, or whatever, I just don't know how. I don't know how to pronounce that. Knock, 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 knock. No, the knocks were too steady for that. And there is no voice yelling at him to open up. <clears throat> He'd seen this door a million times, but suddenly it looked somehow different. 
someone he didn't know was on the other side of the wall, demanding entry in the middle of the night. Uh, somehow, this made the door seem intimidating. Uatani thought he might look through the peephole to see who was outside. He was then disgusted to find himself too scared to even get close to the door. Wait, the intercom didn't have a camera, but it did have a microphone. He turned toward the living room so he could use the intercom to find out what they wanted. Are we going to talk with them? Uatani, it's me. Sorry to come by so suddenly. He stopped when he heard that voice. <sighs> it's me. I'm very sorry to bother you at this hour. Utani tried to remember who the speaker was, but he found he or but found he couldn't, excuse me. But from the tone of the voice and the words, they probably weren't a weirdo. When they said I'm sorry, it sounded like they really meant it. <sighs> Utani sighed softly with relief, and then realized he was still carrying the knife that he had been using to cut cheese. It suddenly felt stupid to feel so nervous. He quickly laid the knife on top of the sink. Hi, hi. I'm going to open it. It's me. Don't you remember? The voice simply repeated itself. But who are you? Uitani whispered to himself as he opened the door. We're going to die, aren't we? We are dead. Uatani narrowed his eyebrows at the people standing there. He looked them up and down, and then looked at their faces again. Their eyes met. What is happening? Uatani suddenly felt a piercing headache. Uatani closed his eyes and put his right hand up to his temple. He could feel the blood pounding in his veins through his fingers. He staggered and quickly put his other hand against the wall to keep him from falling over. The pain was like the old days when he overdosed on antidepressants, but much more intense. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound uh, fun. He grit his teeth against the pain and dug his nails into the wall that was holding him up. As he waited for the pain in his fingers to help dull the pain in his mind, Mr. Uatani, are you okay? He heard a voice he'd heard many times before and felt a concerned hand on his shoulder. He somehow managed to ignore the pain and open his eyes. A worried face was peering down at him. Uh, uh, Overwork, perhaps? You've been so busy lately, you shouldn't push yourself too hard. He opened his mouth as wide as he could and moaned, trying to ease the pain as he let his important guests inside. As he turned his back on his guests, he told himself that it had been a long time since he'd seen them. Or maybe not. It couldn't have been more than two months since they'd last met. It only felt long because he'd wanted to see them so badly. I mean, I thought we were getting ready to stream. Sorry, I was getting a drink of water. While he was out here, he decided he would cut some cheese for himself and his guests. Oh, don't worry about us. What's wrong? The blade wasn't cutting into the cheese. That's strange, he told himself as he pushed down with more force. He cut into its surface, and it made an unpleasant sound he'd never heard before. But no matter how hard he pushed, it wouldn't go further. <coughs> Confused, he yanked the knife back and forth like a saw, but it only cut in slightly deeper. 
It was as if there was something hard against the cheese. And even though he'd only just taken it out of the fridge, it was slightly warm. <laughs> Irritated, he slammed the handle of the knife against the cheese. But all it did was bash, in, bash it in a little. He couldn't cut through it. I'll help you. His guests must have heard the sound because they rushed over. They had another knife. When did they get that out? Yeah, wait a minute. What? What is really happening here, though? There's a trick to cutting this thing. They put the knife up against the cheese and began to move it with a practiced hand. It sounds like your work is going well. They smiled at Uatani, their voices slightly low. Uatani realized that they were trying to keep their voices from being picked up by the screaming microphone and lowered his voice as well. Ah. He grinned and nodded. I guess he is live. His guest had introduced him to a firm that handled advertising space for popular websites, which had been giving him regular work. His reputation had quite quietly spread throughout the small web advertising industry, and soon he was getting more and more offers. Then why do these streams? That's right. His power wasn't meant to be wasted on jobs that anyone could do. No, it's wonderful, I think. And done. After he'd smack it a few times, the cheese was a little funny looking, but the even slices were lined up neatly on the plate. It's nothing. Go on. I'll wait until your stream is finished. Uh, that, that doesn't look like cheese. Uatani took his cheese back to his seat and saw a flood of comments reading he's late and did he log off. Which should have only been three minutes had turned into more than 15. That's not cheese, bro. That doesn't look like cheese. Uatani put a bite of cheese in his mouth and began to chew loudly. <laughs> He apologized to the camera, remembering to keep up the act of being poor and starving. And as he hoped, the comments started to come in. I'm not reading any of these. I'm just, I mean, I'm not reading them aloud. I'm just reading them in my head. There's no way I can just read these all out loud. Huh? Uatani's face took on a confused expression. The comments were strange. He thought there might be something on the camera, but he turned around and saw only his fake poor room. He spoke into the camera, but the comments still didn't make any sense, and they were coming in faster. Maybe there was a problem with the camera. He reached his right hand out toward it. In an instant, his headache was back. Uh, it was the same pain as before. No, worse. He closed his eyes and jerked forward, banging his head against the desk. But the pain in his head was so bad that he didn't even feel it. He tried to hold his head in his hands, but for some reason his right hand wouldn't move. So instead he pushed his other hand up against his temple. It felt squishy. The vein was incredibly swollen, and it felt like rubber and each time he felt his blood pulse through it, there was an unpleasant sensation in his fingers. <laughs> he, 
He stamped his feet against the floor, hoping to find some small escape from the pain. But it didn't even get slightly better. It was then that he realized that he was crying. He could feel the tears coming from his eyes. The pain was moving there now too. <laughs> Unable to bear it, he opened his eyes. Uh... What is happening to him, dude? He gasped. The whole scene appeared in front of him like some kind of awful magic trick. He suddenly heard the sound of something wet dripping onto the floor. His eyes reflexively turned toward it. His right arm was gone at the elbow, and the stump was gushing blood. There was a pool of it on the floor, and the sound he heard was the new blood splattering into it. Huh? Uatani didn't understand what had happened to him. What was going on? He'd just gone to check on a, on a knock at the door. <laughs> the pain screamed within him. Any sense of pain in what remained of his right arm was overcome by the pain in his head. He felt nothing from his arm at all, though he saw the blood dripping to the floor. What in the hell was going on? He blinked and forced his aching eyes to function as he looked around the room. On top of his desk, he found the rest of his arm. It was sitting on a plate. At first, it looked like it was still in one piece, but it wasn't. Please don't show us the arm. It was neatly sliced into uniform pieces. Each piece was about a centimeter wide and the slices moved neatly toward his fingers. They sat upon the plate in roughly his arm's original shape. Miraculously, he saw there was no blood on the tip of his index finger. <laughs> he still didn't understand what or that it was really his own arm. But sheer disgust at what he saw caused him to leap out of his chair. What was this? What kind of prank was this? The contents of his stomach flooded into his mouth. He vomited. The pink fluid splashed against the desk. He saw something solid in the middle of it. It was a thumb. It was covered in bite marks, saliva, and stomach acid, but horribly he remembered it. What? When had he put that in his mouth? In his pain-filled mind, he suddenly heard a sound he'd never heard before. Damn, I still- th I, I think I still gotta like turn down the voice volume. Each time he heard the sound, the pain in his head got worse. He turned toward the camera, hoping for an answer to what was happening. But of course, there was none to be found. The screen was still filling with comments, but his eyes were too filled with tears for him to read them. Yeah, it's it's really hard to, like, grab what's happening here. Like, some of these are, like, you know, very, uh, very concerned comments, but, like, others are just fucked up. As the whole world turned red, Uatani didn't even realize that his lips had turned purple. Or were turning purple. His lips had turned purple from lack of oxygen, but were stained red with blood from his severed thumb, which he had chewed himself. As he tried to fight the pain, he began to fall unconscious, and tears fell from his eyes. The tears seemed pink to him. Uatani was weeping blood. He died, still facing the camera. Yeah, that he did. His guests watched the chain of events unfold and then silently headed for the door. Just before they left the room. Goodbye. They said as if nothing at all was wrong and shut the door.
Wowzers. Oh, boy. What did I get myself into? September 19th, 2015, Friday night. <sighs> ah, woman. Taka Yanagai or Yanagi Moname, or Momane, excuse me, had to finish her concert. Like always, she stayed behind to help put away the instruments. She even helped clean up the audience seats, even though that was the concert hall's job. Only after all of that was done could she take a break. There wasn't too much time left before her solo street concert, but still had to help anyway. She'd always been like that. Even if it wasn't her responsibility, she couldn't help but get involved. It was like in middle school, when one of her friends who wasn't as good at studying asked for her test notes. Or in high school, when a girl she knew asked her how to make Valentine's chocolate for a boy she really liked. She'd stayed up so many nights, her own test grades were worse than her friends, and she didn't even have anyone to give chocolate to on Valentine's Day. In the end, it was the other person's responsibility, not hers, but... Taka Yanagi Momone was at heart scared of not doing everything she could, even if everything wasn't her responsibility. The concert today was another big success. Sure, it was a tiny room that could only fit 150 people or so, a standing room only, but tickets were 3,000 yen, high for a band with an amateur vocalist like her, but they still sold out instantly. It was bizarre how excited the crowd was. She'd heard sobs during the ballad, the ballad, excuse me, and during one of the high-tempo songs, the audience had stood up all the way to the back row. She felt a chill and hugged herself tightly. It's not that her band wasn't popular. And they started out in the Nikonia Sang It category and had kept going by doing covers of popular anime songs. Good to see that Twitch has really expanded to music categories. It helped that her face, which had earned her the nickname Scarecrow in school, could look really good when she wore makeup. And if all of them put on ridiculous costumes and acted like idiots, some people would enjoy that. Videos of their concerts and performances pulled a decent number of views online. But Taka... Taka Yana... Damn, I, I am really fucking up with pronunciations. Taka Yanagi noticed. The vast majority of the people looking at the videos were people who'd come to her concerts. People who'd experienced that insane intensity were going back to the videos to try and feel it again. And Takayanagi knew that they probably wouldn't feel even 1% of it. <laughs> the ticket prices and audience sizes were one thing, but the strangest thing to her was their eyes. Their eyes pierced right through her unblinking. They were like pets, totally dependent on their master. The meaning of the lyrics began to take over their lives, and they never even questioned it. When she first realized that this was happening, she tried to quit the band. Even if she couldn't, she at least wanted to stop doing the live shows where people heard her directly. But the others around her wouldn't let that happen. Your voice is amazing. They would tell her. They forced her to keep singing even as the concerts began to terrify her. Takayanagi tried to get out of it, but in the end she kept giving in. She owed her fellow band members for getting a plain, dull girl like her into music. And for a while, part of her managed to have fun. But in the end, it didn't even matter. Takayanagi lacked the tiny bit of courage needed to break out of the cycle. She forced herself to get up and head toward the street concert, which she didn't really want to do. She'd received an email. She read it slowly. 
So... She almost dropped her smartphone. She read it again and again, trying to control her shaking hands. It was nothing special, just a simple message about one of the songs she'd made. Good song. Keep it up. <gasps> Takayanagi tried to stop the tears, but couldn't. The band would get too many messages like this to count, especially after concerts. She knew it was rude, but to be honest, she was sick of them. But this email address wasn't for her band. It was one for a site where she had anonymously uploaded original songs. In other words, whoever sent this message hadn't come to her concerts. They'd never heard her voice live or felt its strange power. But they had still said they liked her song. <laughs> Wiping away tears that wouldn't stop, she quickly wrote a response. That makes me really happy, thank you. Even after she sent it, she kept crying for a while. She hadn't cried this much since the earthquake. And then she stood up. <laughs> she took her costumes for the day's concert out of her bag, balled them up, and threw them in the trash. It was a white caped outfit worn by some angel character in some anime. Certain fans really loved it, but she didn't care about it at all. She took a wet towel off a nearby table and violently wiped away her makeup. She was never wearing another cape or putting on makeup to look like an anime character again. Never, she said aloud. She realized that she was more excited than she'd ever been before. And then she started to realize what she wanted to do. What would happen if she was going to quit the band? It caused trouble for a lot of people, definitely. Her band was scheduled to play in the Restoration Festival. But even so, she never wanted to sing at another concert. She laughed and kissed her smartphone. She couldn't wait to get home and start fiddling with her music. Over the web, she could really share her music with others. As long as they weren't hearing her voice live, it would be fine. If she just played a recording from a speaker, for example, that's right. She'd leave Shibuya, and when she had a few more songs, she would or she could record them and play them at a street concert. That speaker was small enough that she could fit it under her clothes to fool people. It would be rude to do the same song every time, so each time she'd re-record it at home. Ah, that same knock. There was a knock at the door. One of the staffers, maybe? She smiled and answered them. Now that she'd thrown away her clothes, the or her bag was lighter than she'd ever imagined it could be. That lightness made her think about the future. She was happy. Knock, 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 knock. Excuse me, Takayanagi happily danced toward the door, completely ignorant of what was on the other side. Alright. September 19th, 2015, Friday night. Shortly after she finished, she was walking through Shibuya. She had a limp and dragged one leg behind her, as if it was injured. Her bangs were unnaturally long, most of her face was covered by them. She wore a dark colored dress that seemed to melt into the night, and above it, a bright red cardigan. Her chest, arms, and legs were almost completely covered. 
Despite the fact that the night was still warm, she wore gloves as if it were a sin to show any skin at all. She ran into a couple coming out of a hotel and staggered slightly. But she didn't even look at the people she ran into. Well, that's creepy. She looked down and disappeared into the streets of Shibuya. Oh my god. Chapter 1 Digital Native. The right cider connects the cases. What was all that that we experienced? That was like... Just a lot of... I don't even know how to explain it. I think we're actually getting to the main character now. For example, let's say you asked a kid in middle school, do you know what Schrodinger's cat is? Most would say yes, or I've heard of it. We'll start by eliminating the DQ wins who say they've never heard of it. Next you ask, well, what is it? Next, we eliminate those poor fools say, or who say it's something about a cat in a box, right? Or there's this cat. You don't know if it's alive or dead, right? Or maybe they say there's a cat in a box, and next to it, there's a device that may or may not give off poison gas. You don't know if the cat's alive or dead till you open the box. Everybody knows that. We can eliminate these show-offs as well. Anybody from these groups is a wrong-sider. The right answer would be to describe the experiment and then say, it was a thought experiment proposed by Schrodinger to criticize the quantum mechanical theory that state collapse only occurs after human observation. But barely anyone can do that. And I'd imagine that I'm the only guy who's still in high school who knows that Schrodinger got the idea after exchanging letters with Einstein. I hate wrongsiders. I'd taken a break from investigating the two incidents that had occurred recently in Shibuya, and was paging through some at-channel blog aggregators for a change of pace. As always, articles about bad idols and corporations with terrible work environments were getting tons of hits. It was hard to believe that the crash of 15, a huge news story that had just happened this month, was already off the front pages. Did the people reading and commenting on these sites realize that everything that they read about corporations and idols was carefully controlled? Did they know that most of the big aggregator sites are corporations too? Did they realize that the comments were all manipulated to go one direction or another? Kids our age were living in a world where all the information you could ever want was right at your fingertips. To those of us in the enlightened generation, ignorance was the worst sin. The ignorant were self-righteous, easily manipulated, and eager to push their paper-thin worldview onto others. They were nothing but a nuisance. The worst of the lot were the so-called otaku. I couldn't stand otaku. They were wrong-siders. Man, he would not like uh, Daru. Take the picture on the cover of this magazine. It was from Blood Toon. Any otaku who just watched it for the cute characters was a loser. There was no point in watching the show if you're going to ignore its deeper themes. Yes, I watch my cute anime for the deeper themes. I couldn't stand people who still held, or still held, excuse me, uh, to the old-fashioned idea that only otaku watched anime, but people who ignored the show's themes and just watched it for the cuteness were even worse. They were ignoring the implicit social criticism hidden in... Nani? I stared at the magazine in, an, in amazement. Specifically, I stared at the box that listed the next episode previews. 
The text said that Aaron was missing. Bakaka. Damn it. I'd let my guard down because I knew this episode was written by the guy who wrote the original manga. How could you remove Aaron from the story halfway through? Not keeping her around meant bringing all the internal drama that had been built up so far to a halt. God damn it. So much for my change of pace. I knew I had work to do on the case, but I put away or put it away because I couldn't find any link between the two crimes. I thought for a moment, then took my magazine from its secret stash. It was an issue of an older magazine called Cool Cat Press. People called it a dating guide for normies written by someone who'd never dated a girl in his life, but you'd be surprised. Stupid. I knew it was stupid, but... When I ran an internet search for the number one phrase, nothing came up. And that was the thing. The fact that it didn't show up on the internet meant, to me, that it was worth something. What is happening? Oh shit. I turned to yell at the voice. I hid my favorite magazine behind my back and tried to calm my racing heart. Even if we've known each other since we were kids, don't just come in like that. Ah, the childhood friend. Of course we have a character like that here. I couldn't let her find out. This was bad. Serika frowned. Huh, that's right. Real 16 gigabytes. Serika took a USB memory stick out of her purse. Is that USB 3.0 I see? With that little blue trim there? Oh, oh, Serika looked a little confused. She didn't seem to think much of it as she started to copy or started to copy the data off. Okay, now's my chance. The RV was cramped, but there was a lot of space for storage. I pretended to make tea as I tried to find room on the top shelf. Okay, there's just enough room for one more magazine. And then... I heard a... I, I don't even know how to... A, a shoe shoe sound like a small fart from behind me I'm I'm lost I glanced back and saw that Serica was using the mouse with one hand and fiddling with her Gero froggy Gero strap from the other or with the other and this was my chance the Gero Froggy Gerodo strap was a soft vinyl cell phone strap I'd won in a candy contest when I was a kid. When you pushed its belly, it was supposed to go Gerodo Gero. It turned out to be an incredibly rare prize that could fetch 100,000 yen at auction. But since I was a kid who didn't know any better, I gave it to Serika as a present. Serika seemed to really like it, and ever since she carried it with her. Which, well, that was fine, but... It was old and faded, 
and when you pressed its belly, air leaked out of its side and made a weird noise. It used to go ghetto do ghetto, I think, but now it just made a strange whooshing sound. Ever since she was a kid, she'd had a habit of fiddling with it, especially when she was nervous or focused on something. In other words, she was focused on the computer. Now was my chance to hide it. I jammed the magazine onto the shelf and moved some things so she couldn't see it. Mountain view, de Iga. Ah, yes, a mountain view. I actually, like, when this came up, I was like, wait, what the fuck? This is actually a really cool, uh, fake desktop. What do we got here? Computer, recycle bin, internet escape, Hachi base, after action, so that's after effects, photo store elements, so that's Photoshop, graphics, movies, recovered files, Shibuya incident investigation and we have some beautiful imagery here beautiful and uh yeah this is actually a really cool like windows concept or like um i don't know what you could call it it's obviously based off of windows 7 or vista which is neat it, it's it's nostalgic you know there were quite a few files on the screen I think more Vista than 7. I shook my head, frustrated. I assume they're talking about those two situations we just saw. Just as she was about to leave, I got an idea. I needed to double check my information. She was, in theory, a girl. Uh, こう言われたらどう誠に勝手なのですが好きになってもいいですかってそ、それはいいからどうセリカ thought for a second <笑>年下なのその人え Oh my god, I have to make a choice. What the fuck, dude? Oh no. Alright, yeah, we're saving this for next time. God damn it. Alrighty. Well, thank you guys for tuning in for this first episode, which has uh, truly left me dumbfounded, to say the least. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, and now I, uh, now I feel like I'm paying that consequence. But I'm looking forward to whatever this game has to offer because all I've really touched in the science adventure series was Steins Gate. I'm even jumping into the Steins Gate side games because I like Steins Gate that much. It's a lot of fun. I, I just enjoy that world. Chaos Head, though, as I said in the beginning of the episode, left me very upset and disappointed. Like, it quite literally is, in my opinion, the worst anime I've seen. So... That's why I was hesitant to start Chaos Child, but then I saw, hey, this is on Steam. So I held off, and then boom, a sale, and here we go. I'm totally down to give this a shot, and a lot of people love this side of the series. And I would love to check out the other games, the, the other newer games of the Science Adventure series that uh, one of my friends has been talking about for a while. So... I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna keep my uh, my neck out. Or I'm gonna keep my neck, my head out. Maybe chop my uh, my head off and and keep the neck. But definitely gonna keep my eye out for uh, for what comes about what comes about in terms of the science adventure series and uh, what seems interesting. If I enjoy this, then maybe I should go back and see if I'm able to pick up Chaos Head somewhere. I know it's not on Steam, 
because of the whole localization thing. But I definitely want to poke around, maybe not get my head chopped off, and uh, see what I can find and see what seems interesting. But I do hope that you guys enjoy uh, what I will record of this. Hopefully a complete playthrough. I guess we'll have to see, since it seems like it's going to be branching right from the get-go. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that. This is obviously a blind playthrough. Um, but I, I do hope that you guys uh, in, enjoy whatever journey we go on with this game and whatever route we go on. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So thank you guys for watching, for listening to this rambled outro. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a like, subscribe, all that fancy jazz. And yes, just like the original Steins Gate playthrough I did on my channel, all of these episodes will be approximately an hour long, which means I'm probably only going to get to it like once a week, but oh well. I'll see you guys next time. Take it easy.